well, have you seen it? Have you been watching it? I could ask, hey, not that have you watched it, but have you read it? Because it's everywhere. It doesn't matter if it, you look in the books or whether you look at your screens. It seems like there's a popular theme out there for the stories we like. Hunger Games, Divergent, The Maze Runner, The 100, even The Walking Dead, World War Z, even The Matrix and Planet of the Apes. It's in everything, and it's a popular view. And what it is is that we ruin everything. We basically ruin our planet. And whether it's through war or mismanagement, we have this future that looks bleak. And they're all what we call dystopic. Dystopia, instead of going towards utopia, moving towards something better, the outlook is grim and dim. And we just, we're doomed. That's the outlook. We're doomed. And we're going to destroy the planet one way or the other. And we're going to leave this inheritance to those after us. And they'll have to make their way in the mess. It's the theme. And it's really popular, not because we want it by any means, but it's popular because I think in our heart of hearts, I think we kind of sense that, that we look around and we see our culture and we see our leaders and we see our government and we just see society and we're like, man, we are messed up. And if we don't do something, if we don't do something radical to change where we are, we're going to ruin everything. At least that seems to be the perspective. That's why so many people are for anarchy, believe it or not. Uh, for revolution and this grand reset we're hearing about. It's because of this fear, this, this deep fear that if we don't radically change something, change the trajectory of where we're going, we're doomed. So we got, we got to fix it now or it's going to be too late is the idea. What if I told you that God has the same concerns? More than that. Not only does he have the same concerns, but he so has the same concerns that he's put in place a system and kind of a, a built-in mechanism to keep things on track, to, to, to keep things <laughs> stable and to keep us alive. Believe it or not, it's true. And that's where we are this week. We start a new sermon series called Salt and Light. And it's all about us. It's all about believers, real believers. He, he first did the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. He described what real Christianity looks like, the, the family DNA, what we have in common. But immediately after he describes who we are and how we're supposed to live, he then tells us, hey, you have this great potential. You have this influence. You, you can change the world. And he gives us these two metaphors, these two pictures. The first one's salt and the second one, light. And they're powerful images of what we as beatitude believers can be and do in the world. So today we're going to look at salt. So if you have your Bibles, we're in, we're in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. And this is powerful stuff. Matthew 5, verse 13. So this is what he says. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You are. If you're going to be this believer that I just described in the Beatitudes, if you're going to be that kind of person, guess what? You will naturally be the salt of the earth. What is he getting at? Well, to understand this, we're at a bit of a loss in our culture because we don't use salt as much or in the same ways that they did. And to really grasp this, we need to get in their shoes, and we got to understand what they do. So I just want you to watch this video about how salt has been used. Let's watch this. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Voices from the Fall. Welcome to the history of cured meat, brought to you by Volpe Foods. Curing is a natural process harnessed by humans to preserve meat. You take a hunk of meat, salt the bejesus out of it, hang it to dry for a long period, and bada boom. Prosciutto. Well, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's basically it. Yeah. So there was a guy named of Cato the Elder who lived in the mid-3rd century BC, which is basically negative 250 BC, a point in time in which everyone was saying to themselves, I don't know what we're counting down to, but the suspense is killing me. 
Cato wasn't just some wise old man. He was a military leader and powerful political figure known for censorship and his disdain of the overindulgent and hedonistic. But besides being kind of a prude about everything, he wrote things down. From his farming manual, De Agricultura, he left a recipe from his ancestors' simple past. After buying legs of pork, cut off the feet. One half peck ground Roman salt per ham. Spread the salt in the base of a vat or jar, then place a ham with the skin facing downwards. Cover completely with salt. After standing in salt for five days, take all hams out with the salt. Put those that were above, below, and so rearrange and replace. After a total of 12 days, take out the hams, clean off the salt, and hang in the fresh air for two days. On the third day, take down, rub all over with oil, hang in smoke for two days. Take down, rub all over with a mixture of oil and vinegar, and hang in the meat store. Neither moths nor worms will attack it. No flowery language necessary. Sounds delicious, and it's been a hit ever since. Imagine what it was like without refrigeration. No freezers, no coolers, no ice even. It's like you, you, you couldn't have leftovers like we think of leftovers. You didn't have that magical box sitting in your kitchen that you go to any time and pull out some bologna or hot dogs or salon. You just didn't have it. So when they did meat, that you had, they had two choices. When you did meat, you had to eat the whole thing that time. So when they cook the fatted calf, they invited everybody in town because you had to finish the thing before you were done, before you could leave. Because otherwise it just went to waste because there was no way to keep it. Or you had to eat the whole lamb at Passover. It had to be totally gone. The only other option was salt. And so they salted all their meat. They, that, that's how they did it. They had, they had corners of their house where they had these ham hocks hanging on hooks, and they would just keep their meat away if you wanted meat. That's pretty much how you had to do it. And we don't even think of it that way, but that's the way Jesus' audience thought about it. Now, there's still some throwbacks to that in our culture. One of my favorites of all time that I discovered coming down south that I absolutely love is country ham. I don't know why it's so absolutely awesome, but it is. So I love being able to go down to Bojangles, get a country ham biscuit for breakfast. It is one of the great delights of the world. But I'm telling you, I, I buy country ham. I go to the grocery store and I buy country ham and you will not find it in the refrigerated section. You can't find it there. In fact, you will, you will, you will frustrate yourself trying to find it there. You go to a normal rack in the middle of the stores and you'll see it in plastic there and it will be there forever. I, I believe it'll be there longer than the Twinkies will be there. It'll be way past the zombie apocalypse you will have your country hand because it's the way to preserve meat. So Jesus is saying, hey, listen, in this ham hock called earth, there's this decay. There's, there's this process going on where things are running down where rot is settling in and worms and maggots. And, and left to itself, we devolve and we make things worse. And it's because we're in it, because we're sinners. And we have all this selfishness and pride and lust and greed and this need for control and all of it. And because of this process of decay in the ham hock, Jesus says, you know what the solution is, is some salt. We need some salt. Because that's the only thing that can stop the decay. And so he says this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And what's hidden in that is you is emphatic. I mean, meaning you should be in all caps. You and only you are the salt for this ham hock. You're the only one that can stop the decay. You can only, you're the only one that can stop the spiraling down. You're the only one that I've put in this earth that has a chance of being a buffer, of being a solution for the problem, of being a solution for the decay. I have placed you here and put you in this hammock, in this world, to fight decay. But there's one other thing. What else is salt used for? Food, for, for taste, right? For flavor. Have you ever noticed when you put salt on food, it just gets better? It, it just pops. It, it gets brighter is the, is the word I'd use. 
How, do, how does that work? What, what's, what's going on? Well, we know. Science shows us what salt actually does. When you sprinkle salt on some food and it goes into your mouth, you have taste buds, right? And you have different kinds of taste buds or different portions uh, of the, those buds that things fit in and give a signal to your brain and say, oh, that's sweet or whatever. That's sour. But you have these taste buds that are called bitter taste buds. They're, they taste bitterness. They're, for lack of a better word, they, they're what allows you to taste yuck. Ooh, ah, that's bad. And what salt does is salt fits in those bitter taste buds. It, it goes in and fits so the bitter stuff can't come in. And so no bitter signal goes to your brain. So the good flavors go up. They're enhanced. They pop. And the bitterness goes away. Salt suppresses bitterness. That's how it works. It suppresses the sense of bitterness in the food. And so food tastes better. So Jesus is saying two huge things. He's saying, hey, I've put you here to fight decay. There's this natural decline. Every culture disappears and just falls apart from within. It doesn't matter if you look at the Greeks. It doesn't look if you matter at the Romans or the Babylonians or Persians or wherever you go. The great Chinese empires, they all self-destruct. They all fall apart. Because the common denominator is us, and we got problems. And so God says, my solution for the world, the hope of the world, is my people. Being salt, being out there, being beatitude believers. And so he's saying two huge things. He's saying the world has some problems. <laughs> and one of the problems is this decay we're talking about, that, that hey, we, this is the fear we have. We're, we're going to ruin it. And I could see, I could see you really being discouraged right now. As you look out, you maybe watch the news or maybe you're so discouraged, you stop watching the news. You get out on the social media and you see stuff and you just shake your head. It's like, where are we going? What's going on here? This is that decay. We're going to dystopia. We're going to be at the Hunger Games before we know it. He says, this is the problem, and it's because of sin. But the second problem is because of the worms and the decay. Guess what? There's things like death. There's loss. There's hardship. There's trials. There's bitterness. People suffer. And Jesus said, I put you in this world not only to halt the decay, to fight the decline of your culture, to fight, to, to fight the decline of your society, and and." your neighborhood, wherever you are, but also I put you there because bitterness, it just comes with it. It comes with life, with sin in it. And so people need mercy. They need grace. They need people to come alongside and love them and help them through that loss, help them through that experience of cancer, help them through that experience where their, a loved one has died, help them, help them through abuse, help them through addiction, they need salt to just raise up the, the quality of the taste of life. And more people experience bitterness than others, right? I mean, there's some people like Job. You can think of Job in the Bible. I mean, he had a lot of bitterness. I mean, he, he had a bad bite there. And what God is saying is we're supposed to be there. We're supposed to be out in the world. We're supposed to be halting this perpetual decay. But we're also supposed to be enhancing the quality of life for people that are suffering in it. So the idea of what Jesus is getting at is we are the ones, we are the ones who are called to lessen bitterness and to fight the decay. So again, Jesus is putting a responsibility on our shoulders, not only to be this kind of Christian, but to say honestly, you're the hope. You're the solution. So, so if you're looking at, at government to fix things, it's not going to. You are the salt of the earth. It's not, he doesn't say government is the salt of the earth. He says you are. So it doesn't matter what ism we pick. Now, I think one of the isms is better than all the others, but it doesn't matter which one we pick because we're still in it. So if you pick socialism, you pick communism, you, you, you pick democracy-ism or whatever, Whatever you pick, whatever system you pick, we get this idea that if we just go here, it'll fix things. No, it won't. Why? Because we're still in it. 
And there's still the selfishness and there's still the pride and there's still the lust and the greed and the need for control, all of it. And so it doesn't matter what system we have, guess what? We will corrupt it. And so he's saying, hey, listen, it's not government's the solution. It's believers are the solution. You are the salt of the earth. You and only you is what he's saying are the solution for what ails the earth. You are the only thing that can keep this ham hock tasting good and keep it from decay. And notice what he goes on to say. He says, he says you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. What is he getting at? Salt is this incredible stuff. It's amazing. I could take, I could take this salt, this kosher salt, and put, a, put a, a tablespoon on at a table, go get an acetylene torch, and just blaze the bejeebers out of it. I mean, I could just torch this thing and, and, then, and let it cool, and it will be fine. Because salt is incredibly tough stuff. It is, it is just robust. You cannot destroy salt. I mean, it is tough, tough, tough stuff. Which is good for us because the metaphor is we're the salt of the earth. So that means we can be really tough when we need to be. We can really be solid and persevere in the heat of it. But salt has another problem. And it's this. It leaches and I don't mean like the animal leech. I mean it leeches. You, you just get moisture in the air, and it'll take salt out of salt. You, you can't burn salt, but you can wick it out. And In fact, you can put salt in a pouch, especially down south where the humidity is high, and, and it never gets actually wet. It, it never actually gets soaked with water. But over time, you'll see salt actually salt lines on that pouch. You'll, you'll see it, it's leaching out. It's, it's going away because salt dissolves quickly in water and it just goes away. And so what you have left is just what's not salt. So wherever you go buy salt, <laughs> wherever you get your salt, my guess is there's some impurities. In fact, Morton advertises their, this is not a Morton ad, by the way. Morton actually advertises their impurities. They want you to know they're in there. Like when it rains, it pours. They put something in your salt so when the humidity comes, it still pours because salt has a problem with water. We love our impurities in some cases. We, there's this craze now for Himalayan salt, the pink salt. Well, that's an impurity. That's not real salt. That's not sodium chloride that's pink. It's actually some iron in there that, that is creating that hue. And people are saying, hey, I get my minerals as well as my salt. And so we like sea salt because it has more than just sodium chloride in there. But the problem with, with a leaching is people will get the salt and they'll put it in a bag or put it on a bowl on their table and it'll, it'll get absorbed into the clay with it, when it gets humid. And before they know it, you still have this white powder but you go to taste it, and it doesn't taste like salt anymore. It's lost its saltiness because the real salt has been leached away, has been carried off with the water, and all that's left is the impurities. And that can't halt decay. That can't keep that ham hock from spoiling. And it can't enhance the food you eat. It can't suppress bitterness. It can't lessen the bitterness. And so Jesus is saying salt can lose its saltiness. And when it does, it can't be made salty again. You don't add salt back in. You basically throw out that batch. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So you just throw it out and then you go get a new batch. So what is he saying? He's saying, hey, this whole beatitude life, this this this. Christianity, the way it was meant to be lived, is naturally salty. And let me just say this. Not salty as in irritated and angry like we use it today. But this, this saltiness that preserves, halts that decay and, and, and suppresses the, the pain and hardship and bitterness of life. The problem is this. Our culture doesn't want us to be beatitude Christians. They need us to be because we're the ones that keeping culture and society on track. 
but they kind of resent it because we hold them back from their sin. We, we hold them back from what they want. And so they apply pressure on us not to be salt. Even though they need it, they apply this pressure, hey, don't be salty. And we're caught between God saying, hey, go be salty, and the world saying, hey, don't be salty. And then we have to choose. Will we be silenced? Will we be canceled? Will, will we stop being out in the world and doing the things that we need to do to be salt? And let the culture rot and decay because we're not in it? Let our society spiral down because we've pulled out because we didn't feel wanted or appreciated? And we basically lose our saltiness and the ham hock spoils before our eyes because we've withdrawn. We've given up the beatitude life because you can't live the beatitude life and withdraw. It just can't be done. And so... We become worthless to our culture, worthless to the society around us. And we don't lessen the bitterness and we don't halt the decay. And so we don't have, we don't have value to it. We've lost our purpose. So what's the solution? The solution is not to be silenced and not to be canceled. It's to be beatitude Christians. Do you remember what the beatitudes were again? Blessed are the poor in spirit. You know what the world needs is some humble people that realize they're sinners. The biggest antidote, antidote for, for pride is what? Humility. And, and being poor in spirit is realizing I, I, I'm not the person I need to be. I, I, I don't have anything to offer up that, that warrants God's approval of me and earns heaven. And, and, and because I'm a sinner and, and, and I have my problems, what happens? We get this more humble spirit versus this arrogant spirit. So, so, so we become a, a different kind of person out in the culture that they need to emulate. They need to see that, that hey, stop being so arrogant and judgmental. But it's not just poor in spirit, they mourn, right? We're, we, we mourn over our sin. We have this guilt and shame, and, 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 and because of it, we've reached out to Jesus as our Savior. And hey, the world needs that too, right? They need a Savior. But they need a people in the midst of them that, that understands this sinfulness. What's the next one? It was meekness, right? That's that brokenness that's that submission to god that that's that power and control it basically we become a people that says i want your way lord not my way so so it's not about me being in control anymore it's you being in control and it, it it's, it's about me being content christians will be the content ones out in our culture they, they hopefully we are the ones that don't need more and more and more we accept what god gives us and we can be content in it and, and we don't have that drive and so we can give up all this stuff the world's chasing and we can be the mercy givers and we can be the life givers and we can be out there making a difference because we don't have to have 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 and we don't have to control 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 and it leads to hunger and thirsting for righteousness living differently you know what your work needs every every work environment needs one or two people in it that ha have honesty and integrity that 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 don't rob their employer that don't steal things from work that 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 honor their their boss's wishes and are good employees and 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 do the actual hours that they say they work and just live with honesty and integrity that speak the truth wouldn't that be incredible just to be in a work environment where the truth is spoken in love? We need that. The, the world needs that kind of pressure. One or two people giving that role model. That, that's what salt is. It's not all salt. It's meat with a little bit of salt. And those examples push everybody else to live differently and at a better level. And so we need to be out there living righteously in the mix. And then that leads to the next one, blessed are the merciful, which is coming along and helping people in need. That's the giving the cup of cold water to the thirsty and giving food to the hungry and the poor, visiting the prisoners in jail and coming across the, the people that are abused and helping them and supporting them and encouraging them. It's, 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 it's coming out and doing something about human trafficking and it's something about coming out and helping people with substance abuse. And it's just being out there and saying, hey, we're going to lessen the bitterness of life. And that leads to the next one, that pure in heart, right? Blessed are the pure heart because motives matter. It's this, God wants us to think his thoughts after him. He wants us to have a heart like his. He wants us to love like he is. He wants it motivated out of the same thing. 
wouldn't it be great to have a few people in every environment? Wouldn't it be great if in our government we had a few people that are just, this is about integrity. It's not about agendas. It's, it's not about what progresses what I want because I want more control and more power. But it's like, what is right? I'm motivated by what's right first rather than agenda first. Boy, we need some Christian politicians. We need Christian teachers. We, we need Christian everything, scientists, doctors, in every environment. We need them because we need that purity of heart they bring to that, to the whole culture so that the, those, those enterprises and those endeavors have integrity. Blessed are the peacemakers. And this is the one we most want to pull back from. The righteous one and the peacemakers one. It's like, this is evangelism. It's telling people about Jesus. And and the world so wants us to be silent on this one. But that's what we're here to do. Go tell people about Jesus. And the last one is blessed are the persecuted because, hey, all of the others, that, that difference, the world doesn't appreciate. As I said, the world doesn't want you to be salt. But God does. And the world needs you to be salt. It's just the way it is. You are the salt of the earth. You and only you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, if it gives up the beatitude, that beatitude life, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. There's one other thing here that I I, I need to point out. The idea of salt in every every scenario we've talked about this morning, the salt has to actually get out of the shaker to work. There's there's a givenness to salt. There's this idea of sacrifice, of of being in the meat. You notice that, that the meat doesn't come into the salt, but the salt goes out and gets into the meat. And, and it's actually gets absorbed inside the meat in order to work. There's this tendency in Christianity to, to, to get in the shaker. And, and I think our kids need to be in the shaker to grow and develop and be solid Christians. Don't, don't get me wrong. But as Christians, beyond worship and small group and those kind of things that we need to encourage and grow, God wants us on the weekdays to be out of the shaker and in the meat. He, he wants us to be, in a sense, given to me, to, to realize that, hey, I've got a purpose, and it's not here in the shaker, right? It's beyond the shaker, and if I insist on always being in this Christian enclave, you can't be salt. You'll never suppress bitterness. You'll never enhance anybody's food. You'll never make their food taste better. If, if we're always in our own shaker, we can't help anybody outside our doors. And, and, and if we're always in our shaker, we can't be in all of these realms of life, the school boards, the, the state and local government. We, 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 can't, we, can't, we can't be in industry. We, we can't be in any of these organizations where salt is needed. There's, we need Christian people everywhere. That's the idea. That's how salt works. And we've got to see and think about this in a different way. That, hey, God's intention for us is to be out there. It is to be in the meat. It is to be out of the shaker. And out in our culture and out in this society to have the kind of influence that only, and I say the word only, only we can. Because you and only you are the salt of the earth. But you will only be the salt of the earth if you get in the earth. And I'm not saying become of the world. I'm saying being in the world, but yet still a beatitude believer. And when we think about it, this is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus could have stayed in his shaker, right? He, he could have. He could have stayed up there with the Father and the Spirit and, 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 and been in a little holy enclave. And they, they would have stayed pure and faultless. And I'm not saying they're still not pure and faultless. But they could have stayed up there and been happy and together and all of that. But there was a problem down here. There was this mess. 
There was this decay. There was this bitterness. And Jesus left heaven and showed us what it's like to leave the shaker and get out in the world and be a beatitude type of person who has showed mercy and clinged to righteousness and was a peacemaker and was pure of heart and because of it was what? Was persecuted. And even though the culture pushed back and even though they persecuted him, he insisted on being salt first. That's the example we've got. And not only that, but he came down and he made more salt. He made us to be like Christ, Christians, beatitude believers, so that we could go out and do even more. He said we would do greater things than he's done. We can get out there, wherever God has called us, whatever, whatever vocation you have, whatever industry you belong in, you're there for a reason, and it's a vital part of God's plan for you to be there and to be a believer there. Because only as you get out of your shaker and live the beatitude life there can you be what the world needs. Be salty. And, right, limit the bitterness and halt the decay so that everything around us becomes a better place. And we do this for the people around us out of love. We do this for our kids because they inherit it, but we do it for him. Because he told us to. Go be the salt of the earth. Let's pray. Lord, we do praise you. We thank you that we're your plan. Lord, that's amazing to me to think that when you saw the mess, when you saw the decay, you saw the rot, the, the solution that you put in place was us, was your people. Lord, that is so encouraging. That's so exciting to think that we can have that kind of influence, that we can have that kind of effect on our culture, on our society, on our government, that we are the solution that you have put in the world. Lord, help us to embrace that responsibility. Help us to see it clearly. And, and Lord, help it to motivate us, not to pull back, not to be silenced, not to be canceled, but to be motivated to be even more the kind of people we were called to be out there. To be those role models, those people of integrity and honesty. To, to be those people of love and mercy and grace. To be those kind of people of truth and the gospel. To be the kind of people that change the world. Help us to realize that real change happens because we obey you and we get out of the shaker we go out into the world and we're like you help us in that forgive us for for being complacent forgive us for 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 maybe being intimidated and 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 and, and shut down and motivate us again give us the boldness we need to be the people we're called to be to change the world we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.